As we've heard, author Michael Coren argues that Islam's history, theology, and politics have led to Christian oppression around the world. Joining us now for their views on the matter, we welcome Imam Shabir Ali, the president of the Islamic Information and Dawah Center International, Farzana Hassan, Toronto Sun columnist and a former president of the Muslim Canadian Congress, and Mohammed Fadl, Toronto Research Chair for the Law and Economics of Islamic Law at the University of Toronto's Faculty of Law. And of course, we welcome back the author himself, Michael Coren. You've all heard the interview. You've all had a chance to look at the book, and uh, I want to hear your feedback now. Muhammad, would you get us started? Pick one thing that you heard and tell me what you think. Um, well, I just think the whole narrative is very polemical and selective. Um, you told me not to give everything at one time, so I will stop there. <laughs> well, uh, put a little more flesh on that bone if well, you would. Well, I think, you know, every case of, um, let's say, Muslim Christian violence is attributed to Islam. Right? Whereas in all other religions in the world, whenever there's a case of religion X, or somebody from religion X committing violence against somebody from religion um, Y or Z, or whatever it is, mm -hmm. it's, it's not attributed to that religion, it's attributed to that person or some other extraneous religion re uh, reason. But in all cases of Muslim violence, it's always Islam. So Islam is always the uh, proximate and but for and only cause for violence when it comes to Muslims. And you see that as a double standard. Well, it's not just a, it's, it's not just a double standard. It's, um, uh, well, I guess maybe that's the simplest way of putting it, okay. a double standard. Could you give me one example in the book that when I do that, by the way? Several. Your dismissal of one. Hindu violence against Christians. Um, I can't remember uh, discussions of, uh, the, of, the, of the Serbian massacres against Bosnians. I don't um, talk about that. I, talk well, about, I don't uh, talk about I said, India, though. Yes, you do, and you dismiss it, basically. Well, I don't, Hindu. actually. I, I speak as someone who, who's married to uh, a woman from that country, and I talk about Hindu culture and how the Hindu government reacted to what was the most appalling pogrom, as I call it, of Christians in an Indian state. I don't dismiss it. That's simply not no, true. No, but you, you don't attribute it to Hinduism. No, I don't think it was attributed to, to okay, Hinduism. Okay, but this is, this is my point. Christian on Christian violence, Christian violence on Muslims, it's always said this is to be con this is contrary to Christianity, right? But it's never the case with Muslims, right? Which is done in the name of the religion. Right. It's the everything is attributable to Islam as the most important, maybe the only causal factor of any kind of violence. Okay, let's get the Imam in. Your view. Um, what struck me about the book is, is this unscholarly uh, manner of, of reporting and dealing with uh, sources. I know Michael just said to you in the interview that it wasn't meant to be a scholarly book, uh, but in the book itself he distinguishes between internet type uh, articles and scholarly writings and he clearly positions positions his book as a scholarly book. But uh, scholarly means you have to use uh, proper sources and you have to use the sources properly. Uh, in well, terms of using the sources properly, I find that he uh, miscites. For example, in the first chapter where it, he deals with context, he cites uh, uh, Reza Aslan's book, No God But God, uh, for his definition of, uh, is, uh, of jihad as meaning holy war. But uh, uh, I have a copy of Aslan's page 82 here, where Aslan clearly says that holy war is not by any means a proper definition of jihad. Uh, and, and jihad actually, uh, he explains it in greater detail, but he's definite about that it's not holy war. Okay, but the fact so, that he's not intended to write a scholarly book, he's, he's written what he hopes is a popular book that more than just academics will read, does that mitigate what you're saying? Well, no, because we teach our kids, thou shalt not lie. Uh, you you, can, you cannot there... attribute to an author the opposite of what he said uh, in, in a book that you're writing. It's just not acceptable. Well, let's be sure mm -hmm. we're... Are you saying yeah. there are lies in the book? Uh, there is at least this Mistakes one mistake, a, a misattribution, and, uh, and it is important, even if we're writing a non-scholarly book, uh, to still cite correctly. If I may, I talk mm -hmm. about the greater and lesser forms of jihad. Um, this is a very good example of trying to digress from an issue here. We're speaking about the massacre of Christians that's occurring as we speak, and you're more concerned, well, uh, sir, with what you said. I didn't really even quite understand the premise, because it's simply not true. I mean, I'm, I'm, at, pains it is true. I, I'm at pains to point at out, page I'm at pains to point out that Christians have committed terrible crimes. What I have said in the book, and this is vital, is that they do it in spite of what is said in the New Testament. And if anyone can find me a passage in the New Testament where violence is called for, I will listen to them. That's okay, the point I'm making. 19, verse 27. Could, could I let the Imam finish his point, Okay, yeah. so in answer to your question about the New Testament, Luke chapter 19, verse 27, mm -hmm. Jesus describes 
describes himself as a king who will return. Mm -hmm. And on, the, on his return, he says, yeah. bring those who did not want me to be king over them and slaughter them here before me. The book of Revelation shows that when Jesus returns, he will come with a sword out of, of his mouth and he will slaughter his enemies. The whole New Testament actually has the underlying premise that even though Jesus is shown to be the Prince of Peace, the underlying premise is that he was to be the Messiah, son of David, who would overthrow violently Roman rule, and he would set up the kingdom of God on earth, the same kingdom for which Christians continue to pray, whether they understand the meaning of the prayer Jesus or not. When did Jesus call for the Roman authorities to be overthrown by violence? Uh, th this is not represented clearly enough in the New Testament because no, the New sir, Testament. I'm asking you a question. Where, where, I, mean, I don't want to get into theology here, but I, I, I'm, I'm talking about the history. I'm where not does Jesus yes. call for the Roman authorities to be overthrown or anyone to be overthrown by violence? Uh, this is well known. Nolan's book, for example, on the history of Jesus and his political aspirations, and several scholars have written about this. The, the charge against Jesus for which he was said to be crucified was that he was claiming to be king of the Jews, yeah. which meant that he was in direct opposition to. Caesar at the time. No, he, he was, uh, gentlemen, he was executed for his theological claim I'm, I'm to be son of God. Michael, never forgive me. Paused. You can't answer the question. I, I'm going to jump in a bit here because I'm feeling a little bit like a host on Crossroads <laughs> Television at the moment <laughs> rather than TVO. Yeah. And I do want to get back to the actual uh, nuts and bolts of the book. Farzana, come on in and tell us your reaction. Um, I generally agree with Michael. By and large, I agree with Michael's argument. Um, I was in Pakistan recently, and uh, while I was there, the, the High Court. Uh, in Lahore, Pakistan, rejected the appeal of Asia Bibi, who is the Christian woman, and she's been on death row in, in Pakistan. She's languished in a Pakistani prison for the last five years. And why is she there? She, well, she's accused of blasphemy. She's, she's, she's accused of uh, having insulted the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, there was an altercation between her and, and two, uh, two Muslim women who refused to share uh, the same utensil with her. This eating, was the, the drinking exactly, of... Exactly. And, and she, she said something in that altercation. We don't know what she said. There were no witnesses. There were no independent witnesses there. Uh, but, but, you know, she, she was apprehended. She has been in a Pakistani prison. And, and, and I think that the idea of blasphemy or blaspheming is very much germane to Orthodox Islam. So I think that that, that is an example of uh, how you can uh, attribute, you know, the, the discrimination. I think there is discrimination systemic uh, in Muslim countries. And I think that we have to be honest about it. Are let me ask this side of the table. Are you not being, in the words of Farzana, honest about what is at the root of a lot of well, this there's persecution the in the world? There's between systemic discrimination and Islam waging a war against Christianity and Christians. Right? This is another thing is that by using hyperbolic language, right, I think it distracts from the real issues, which Farzana mentioned, and how we could actually achieve solutions for these real problems. There is, of course, massive amounts of structural discrimination um, and uh, sometimes violence um, and sometimes marginalization. But it's not simply directed to Christians because they're Christians. That's one way it manifests itself. It's, not, it's one way it manifests itself, right? But you have massive structural injustices and bad government and um, weak institutions. So if he'd said this is more politically based or culturally based rather than religiously Absolutely. based, you'd be okay with Absolutely. that? Absolutely. Wouldn't be true. Though. Absolutely. It wouldn't be true. I, I, as I say I, in the book, I'm, I'm not sure if you to, have read the book. I, I, I didn't get a chance to finish. Okay, I didn't sorry. interrupt you, right? Well, you did. Go, go ahead, Mohammed. Go ahead. Uh, you know, if we're going to get into a religious dis the debate, right, then we actually, you know, what the Imam said, you have to use your sources properly and, um, and uh, you have to use the right sources. Again, I don't like to get into the theological debates because as a lawyer, I'm sort of agnostic as to the relevance of theology and the way people behave because most people are theologically ignorant. Well, okay? let me but, but um, many of the verses he cites in the Quran don't have anything to do with Christianity. Right? He, he omits lots of, he omits, he omits several verses in the Quran that deal specifically about the importance of the sanctity of houses of worship of any religion. He, don't, he omits an explicit verse that talks about love between Muslims and Christians. And so it's a very, that's a very See, selective I, I, I must reading. I respond to this, now, because this, we, this is not but true. This is, it's, this is I don't simply think it's, not true. I don't think it's relevant. 
See, well, I don't think anything else is relevant. It's you said something which isn't true. When I, I quote various passages, there is much I could quote. I don't even, and I, I don't quote the Hadith at all, I think you, you may notice, because I think in many ways that's more severe. Well, but, let's remember, it's, it's, this is less than a 200-page yeah. no, book. Hold on, you didn't I, want to cover I, 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 I've, I've, I have nothing to be ashamed of okay. here. When I quote verses in the Quran, I do not say they're specific to Christians, because they are not. Uh, and I also speak about where, and I mention lyrical, poetic phrases within the Quran. I talk about this. I speak about this. I speak about the first victims, if anything, of radical Islam being other Muslims. I'm, I'm at pains to stress this. But th this is very interesting. There is a mass persecution taking place. And I, I don't know you, so I do know Shibu, and I'm sure you're appalled by it. What is happening in many countries where there's a Muslim majority or even a significant Muslim minority, that needs to be discussed. Even though if you want to argue Islam doesn't preach this, I'll listen to you. But you must surely admit that it's being done by Muslims in the name of Islam, not economic injustice, not oppression, but in the name of Islam. That let's, has to be addressed. Let's find out. Imam, I, I, do, you, I do you agree that these killings, and he has chronicled them chapter and verse in the book, have been done by people who are Islamic, who are Muslims, in the name of their faith? I don't mean to deny the discrimination and the killings that do exist, and uh, I would like to put them in the same context in which uh, Professor Fadl has uh, nicely put them. Uh, but at the same time, I maintain that uh, uh, Michael is not using proper sources to document these events, and uh, that's apart from the fact that he has the wrong interpretation of these uh, events. But you're not uh, denying the events took place, are you? Well, well, that too, is, some of it is questionable, Good highly God. questionable. For example, one of Michael's sources that he praises very highly is an article from Shobat.com, which is run by uh, uh, Walid Shobat and his son. Well, his son what usually recently, uh, the, 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 the article which uh, Michael cites was written by both authors, but one author wrote this just recently, and this is how he concludes his article. These Albanians and the rest of the pagan Muslims of the Balkans need annihilation by a righteous Christian nation. God bless the Serbs for killing these reprobates, and may God appalling. curse Clinton for bombing these righteous Christian people. Appalling. Now, now, appalling, yes. And what do I say but about in your the book? book you what do I said, say about it? You have actually said that they are a very good source, that yes. they, they and I also check out their information I, very sir, carefully. I also criticize them for what they have written. The, the you did not. The, I say that the information, sir, this is important because people tell are dying. Where, tell the me where you have the information, them. the information is accurate. If you criticize, if you can criticize any of the information about the slaughter and killing, I will listen to you. I've never been a supporter or fan of the, uh, particularly of one of the people involved here, but to criticize the sources Tell me the where issue. you have said that they are wrong. <laughs> Tell me in your this book. Is, I'm not going to go And I will show you where you have actually I, this, praised this them. Is, you said this Walid Shobat. This is denial, this is denial of massacre. This is, this I am not denying objection. the massacre, but your like, book is proving to be a distraction <laughs> from the actual killing and discrimination that is actually when there and will, that we need to deal with. Will you admit there is slaughter, there is killing, there is terrible discrimination? Yes, I admit that, but your book is a distraction because your book makes a bigger point which is untrue and you use your sources incorrectly it has to do with this in doing it, it, I need to ask okay you question. cited the Quran which which translation of the Quran did you use does it have anything to do with this I'm not does. gonna play your game it does I, because I've, done, I've done this so many times you, where instead of addressing the suffering and the massacre you try to bog down in, in punctilios and move and move away from the major point but you are Is, making do a we, bigger do point we have to this? deal with the massacre of Christians that's occurring right now, I mean, when, when someone we, even like Prince Charles, God bless him, says we have to stop what is going on, when Iraq is looking to becoming Christian free, when a Pakistani couple, Christians, are beaten to death for apparently defacing a Quran, d does your heart not bleed? Uh, my heart bleeds also for the fact oh. that you have relied on a, 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 an Islam hater. Uh, in a there book are in hundreds which, of sources in there. In a book in which you are trying to say that Muslims hate Christians, Shabir, but actually the Shia are other Muslims. Let's hear from Farzana, please. Well, I would like to ask Imam Shabir the question. I, I have had great difficulty with this notion of zimitude in Islam. I mean, I think that it, it, it's, it's, it's a notion, notion of what? zimitude or, you know, the, this zimi tax that, that is imposed on uh, non-Muslim minorities in a Muslim state. Now, the way I understand it, if, if Christian communities, for example, in a Muslim country don't agree to paying the tax, their lives, liberties, security, all in jeopardy. And I think that that's what's happening in, in countries like Nigeria, you know, because Boko Haram has captured Christian girls. They're being con converted to Islam, I, I think, against their will. I think that that is a very, very problematic concept uh, within Sharia law. And, and what would you have to say to that? In my understanding, the, 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 the practice of having uh, 
non-Muslims as a minority in the Muslim state and they pay a tax that is referred to as the jizya and that they're considered to be protected minorities in that uh, as part I of that whole package that, yes. um, is it, based on a misreading of, of what the Prophet Muhammad was doing in his time. Uh, he lived in a certain time and era in which uh, there were um, conquered and, uh, and, and conquerors. Um, we live in a very different time now in which people live together in harmony uh, as equals, in, uh, citizens of great countries, and uh, they all pay taxes together in the same way. Uh, this is how an Islamic democracy uh, should run in a modern time. And uh, the idea of keeping some non-Muslims as a sort of a second-class citizen where they are subjected and they pay a tax that represents that you subjection, oppose that. I would oppose, you that. oppose that. Mohammed, you want, yeah. Mohammed wanted to make a point. Uh, several points, and I, I've <laughs> sort of forgotten which ones I want to make. Yeah, yeah there is this idea of, 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 of dhimmi and ajizya. These are historical doctrines that Muslim states have repudiated. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't have fringe apocalyptic fundamentalist groups who behave on their own and try to do this. And this is the point I want to make. They're not is fringe that, groups. Well, <laughs> the problem that you have in Muslim countries, right, is very, very poor governance, very weak states, the inability of, of public institutions to <clears throat> exert control over their territory, right? And I would just say generally that it's a very bad to be a minority in a weak state whether you're a Muslim or a Jew or a Christian. Right now, what's going on in Myanmar, I'm sorry to say, is probably on, on several orders of magnitude worse that's happening in Egypt. Maybe it's equivalent to what's going on in Iraq. I but, agree with right? that. I would now, agree with that. My, now, see, the, I just want to conclude with this one example. Why is it the case, when, if you look at the, the violence that you see in Egypt mm -hmm. directed toward cops, why is it all in Upper Egypt in the countryside and it's not in Cairo? It is right? almost exclusive. I mean, it's not. Now, and always, this is my but point. I would agree with if the it point, were yeah. theologically driven, mm -hmm. right, you would see this across the board, right? But this is, it might be, Islam might be a factor, but so is poverty, so is tribalism, so is lack of education. Uh, so is and, and so is economic opportunity. Can I get Michael? Uh, right. This do, is do this is my objection. And I write about yeah. this in the book. And of course, there are aspects. I'm not a simpleton. I do understand context here. But you mentioned weak states. Now, Turkey is not a weak state. Iran is certainly not a weak state. Turkey is an interesting example because Turkey has very few Christians. Now, th th there's a certain nuance here because many of those who are Christian are Greek or Armenian and there's a certain ethnic hatred going on there. I would understand that too. But Islam does play a part. You've seen with the increasing Islamization of, of Turkey in the past 20 years, attitudes towards Christians have got progressively worse. Now the strong state prevents slaughter. In Iran, Christians, people who are born Christian are generally protected. Um, particularly Pentecostals who convert, they've been executed by that very strong government. Look, I, I'm prepared, what, what you, the point you made about Dimitri was very interesting because I think if anything is essential at this point, it's an interpretation of Islam. The way, as I mentioned in the interview, that in Judaism, no Jew believes that every aspect of Old Testament teaching applies to the 21st century. Some do, some we may find bizarre, but they're not violent. But those Muslims who say this is a misreading of Muhammad, this is a misreading of what occurred in the 7th or 8th or 9th century, that is a very interesting deb debating point. But Shabir, you know that your voice is a minority voice. You know that in the Islamic heartlands, your voice may even be condemned as being heretical. Yes, I agree to all of that. Uh, and, and I wouldn't mind if you wrote a book that explains this particular fact. That wasn't uh, the my, purpose of the book. The purpose of the book is to highlight the suffering of Christians. Uh, but in doing so, you have actually over-highlighted by using incorrect sources. You You've have named used, one. Uh, well, I've Which named okay, Walid Shobat let's not return to the, and, and Theodore Shobat. Hang on. I don't want to yeah. return to that argument because we've had that. But do you take personal offense at the title of the book? Yes, I do, because the, the title is highly misleading. It's, it's saying basically that Muslims hate Christians oh, no. and that this is Islam. systemic, that, that, <laughs> that Islam um, has a war on, on Christianity. And uh, in order to support the, the meaning of that, that clearly jumps out of that title, he has a whole chapter entitled Context, to which he refers again and again uh, throughout his book. He's always saying, well, this kind of systematic slaughter of Christians is due to what Islam teaches. 
to the extent that at one point in the book he tries to say that it's not the moderates who rightly understand Islam, uh, it is the fundamentalist who actually slaughters Christians that really understand what Islam historically and That's textually teaches. That's actually a quotation, by the way, but this is a uh, point. From whom? This from is a certain a, this, Reverend Shafi, who you take to be an expert in Islam now to, to pontificate no, on no, what no, Islam no, no, means. No, it, it's very interesting that you haven't critiqued the book, you critiqued sources you don't like. Now, if I may respond. No, I'm no, saying this, a, if I, this is not this, a proper this use is not of about sources. egos here. This is about about what is going on in the world, and I am a trained scholar, and I will respond to you. Shobat is, is not someone I support. If you can critique the information, then you have a viable point. As for Reverend El Shafi, he is an Egyptian Christian who has a voice, and I quote him. I quote various voices in the book. Again, what he says is to be listened to, even if you reject it. We haven't yet spoken about what it's like to be a Christian in a majority Muslim country today. We've spent most of this interview trying to get off topic. It's a question of digression, and it happens every time we speak I'd like about to the bring, issue. Can I bring another voice to the table here? And it is the voice of the head of the World Jewish Congress, Ronald Lauder, who wrote in the New York Times um, just a few months ago, why is the world silent while Christians are being slaughtered in the Middle East and Africa? The Middle East and parts of Central Africa are losing entire Christian communities that have lived in peace for centuries. The terrorist group Boko Haram has kidnapped and killed hundreds of Christians this year. Half a million Christian Arabs have been driven out of Syria during the three plus years of civil war there. Christians have been persecuted and killed in countries from Lebanon to Sudan. In a speech before thousands of Christians in Budapest in June, I made a solemn promise that just as I will not be silent in the face of the growing threat of anti-Semitism in Europe and in the Middle East, I will not be indifferent to Christian suffering. Christians can openly practice their religion in Israel, unlike in much of the Middle East. Okay, question emerging from that. Mohammed, let me get you first. At what point can we say that Islam is in some way responsible for the persecution of Christians? To, okay, to say in some way is not a meaningful statement, right? Because what we need what to understand... What would you prefer? How should I have said What it? we need to understand is... Um, uh, if we, need, we need to have some sort of system of determining what lawyers call materiality. Right? There needs to be some sort of threshold to try to determine what is the most important factor to explain all of this. Right? It's my opinion that religion is not. And I say, and I try to be consistent. You know, when, when Lebanese Christians in the Falange Party massacred thousands of Muslims, I don't attribute it to Catholicism, even though they might think that they're behaving, um, they're defending their faith. Same thing with Serbs, right? I try to you know, analyze these situations through the lens of political categories, right? And maybe I'm naive, but I also think this is, a, this is a tack that anyone who is interested in a future has to take. So even if, right, you might think I'm empirically wrong in all of these cases, it's the position that one must adopt if one wants to have a, a hopeful future. Otherwise, you have to call for genocide, right? What? Now, Yes, because if you attribute, if you attribute, there's another word. If you if you attribute, if if I attribute every act of anti-Muslim violence by Christians to something inherent to Christianity, then essentially I'm left with 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 the only the only device is to destroy Christianity. So what, that's what, the only what, what a bizarre now, conclusion based on a bizarre premise. Look, first well, of all, Le Lebanon's a different situation, and he's wrong to talk about it, because Lebanon was a power struggle between three, four maybe groups, and, and the, the, the life of a Christian in Lebanon is very different. It's a powerful group, often with, with European backing. I'm talking about the Christians of mm -hmm. Syria, Iraq, Egypt, Pakistan, Sudan, Turkey, Indonesia, Indonesia, Turkey. I mean, again, there's an attempt being made here to, to paint, to make blanket statements. Once again, we haven't addressed the daily life of Christians. Anyone who says that every Muslim hates a Christian is a bigot or a fool. Anyone who says that uh, you, you can be a faithful Muslim and, and, and not be a loving, tolerant person doesn't understand Islam. But we also have to establish that terrible crimes and cruelty are being committed towards Christians by Muslims in the name of Islam. That is a moderate position to take, and okay. it's being rejected. Do you, go for, do you go further than that, though, and say that there is something particular about Islam? I ask questions. I ask questions, and I ask people to comment on... on, on. Most of the book is, is actually just uh, chronicling the attacks that have taken place, and the evidence stands up to all sorts of scrutiny. Farzana, yeah. what about you on that? Do you think uh, there's something particular about Islam I, that makes it more violent than other religions? Well, first of all, I'd like to start by adding to my earlier comment that, you know, the persecution exists across the board. And it's not of the same level and ma or magnitude everywhere, you know, let me also say that. Uh, because, you know, there's Boko Haram in Nigeria, but there are also examples of tolerance in, in other parts of, uh, the, you know, the Islamic world. 
However, I would say that um, Islam does not expressly say, go kill Christians, go kill Jews. It, it, you know, I agree. It doesn't say that. However, I think that there are doctrines there that, that are very easily corruptible. And, and I think that, the, you know, this, this whole notion of, you know, the Zimmi tax and, uh, you know, the fact that, you know, Christians are at a lower rung of the ladder in an Islamic state. And I, and I believe that because I think that there are provis provisions in Sharia law that create hierarchies in society based on religious adherence. But you've already heard the imam say that's wrong. I, I don't agree that. with the imam. I don't agree with that. No, 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 that he I, doesn't support that. He doesn't dispute yes, the yes, existence I, of it. He doesn't agree with that. But, but, but would he agree that, you know, Sharia does create opportunities, you know, for, for Muslims to go and persecute Christians because of Sharia provisions? And there are plenty. Misinterpretations and, of Sharia? Um, I think that that's the mainstream view. I think that the mainstream view is the accepted narrative. It's the accepted narrative among many Muslims. I think that that's a problem. I think it's widespread. Hmm. And, and that is why you see the masses react the way they do. If, if, they, if there is perceived provocation, if, if they feel that, you know, Islam has been insulted or the Prophet Muhammad has been insulted, you know, they, they will have this reaction because that is the general perception, unfortunately. Muhammad. I, I agree with what Farsana is saying. Right, but I maybe this is a question of, of semantics. But when one says, right, there's um, I can't remember the terms that you use. Provisions and sharing. No, 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 not you, right, but right. but Michael, right? Um, you would get the impression, I think, that there is some sort of organized campaign in the Muslim world, generally, to eliminate Christians and Christianity from their countries. I don't think it, and, have you said that? No, I didn't. It's and, interesting. And, but I'm not sure and, which book he read, but I will say but, this. But see, when you attribute, on, yeah. you know, Islam's war on Christianity, that implies intent yeah. and purpose, right? What Farzana is talking about, what I agree with, and what the Imam agrees with, right, is that there are deep problems, but they are not a result of intent and purpose. There's, this is not some kind of holocaust where there is an ideology, right, of racial, of ethnic cleansing and extermination. And mm -hmm. the danger here that I see is that when you read the first chapter, it's, it makes, gives you the impression that the, these criminals in Muslim societies who burn churches, who rape Christians, who kill them, are acting out of some sort of religious piety. Well, and what say I'm saying, <laughs> I, I, you know, no, I don't think any but reasonable Muslim could believe that burning a church or raping a woman can be an act of piety, mm. now, period. Let, let, right? me, let me respond to that because, again, I'm not actually sure what book you're reading, but that's fine. Uh, the, the evidence and the facts are, are so obvious. It, only to those who do not want to see or are consciously or in a contrived manner blind will not see what is going on. Is there a campaign? There are Muslims. It's a minority, but there is a sizable number of Muslims who would like to see uh, an, an Islamic world, you can call it a caliphate, that's only one interpretation, that was free of non-Muslims. That's certainly true. There have been a deliberate attempts in Iraq and Syria in particular to remove Christians and Christianity from the region. And it's very interesting that as much as, as Saddam w was a monstrous despot, and Assad, lesser so, but still a, a dictator, th they were men who were secular, who in fact were, were, were arrested, incarcerated Muslim fundamentalists. As soon as the vacuum developed, as soon as those strong men were removed, there was chaos, Sunni killing Shia Can and I terrible violence, but, but Christians were deliberately and still are being deliberately targeted. You, is that a campaign? Feel, well, it's not an accident. Do you, do you feel a little bit word? Let me try yeah. this. Do you feel a little bit, because you, you mentioned Assad earlier, that mm. Christians did better under Assad, yeah. Christians did better under Saddam. Do you feel a little odd sort of defending yeah. these awful despotic figures oh, yeah. in history? I would never. Look, I, was, I, I think the Iraq war was a disaster. Look, I think the Iraq war was probably the, the, the greatest tragedy to befall it, Arab Christians in 50 years, actually, because it didn't, um, it didn't invent fundamentalism, but it, it liberated fundamentalism. But the, like. the solution, surely, is not to have these strong... I think the solution was to remove uh, Saddam and putting someone else. Assad is a different case. I don't know how we actually deal okay. with that issue. It's far too complex. Different story. Uh, mm -hmm. Imam, can I... Just I just want to say yeah. one quick thing here. Okay. ISIS is a cult. And it's an equal opportunity killer. Yeah. It's killed Shias. Yeah, but but you have lots of this violence. I don't talk about ISIS no, but, in the but, book. The, but the, the, you know the the, the 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 name that's you know what's the the, the what's the word from Oliver from Oliver Wilde? You know the thing Oscar that we, Wilde? Oscar Wilde. The, the love that did not speak his yes, name. The love it wasn't actually him. It was you're, you're attributing all these acts of violence to even mainstream Muslim fundamentalists, which is not fair. 
right? Because this is an act of, like in Iraq and Syria, of ISIS, right? So, it's not, so I, it's I, not mainstream. I, I know you're it's a liar, not, but it's quite incredible. Wait, you, you, well, you, the I book was written okay. before Gentlemen, ISIS existed. Let, let's wait, hear from wait, the imam, please. But ISIS, please. ISIS was part of Qaeda. Point made. Point made. Equal, equal opportunity killers killing Sunnis, Shis, no. Christians. They've slaughtered hundreds okay. of yes, thousands of are. Sunnis. I talk okay, about please. ISIS, I talk about Christ, the violence against Christians. Could we please have Shabir Ali come in? You wanted to make a point. Um, uh, the, the book seems to be an impressive uh, collation of uh, news articles dealing with uh, violence against Christians across the world. Uh, but when that list is uh, scrutinized carefully, it would uh, be, be clear that, yes, there are some true such incidents, and we have to do something about that. We can't allow that to continue. Uh, second, that uh, those incidents are occurring not only against Christians, but violence against uh, Shi'is, against Sunnis, against Ahmadis, against Baha'is, against people in, in more, more generally. Uh, and, and we cannot take a, a self-centered type of approach and say, okay, let's just look at the violence done against one group, whether Christians or anybody else. But what is more important here is to, to recognize is that uh, many of the incidents actually are uh, reported firsthand from, from fellow Christians who may subscribe to what Candida Moss called in her book, The Myth of Persecution. Uh, she documents a history of, of Christianity in which Christians uh, feel that to be persecuted somehow makes you right. Good and and it, it's, it's, an, it's an awful thing to think that this has actually happened, but she's documented it in her book. And uh, if, with that sort of mindset, we have to now uh, look at independent sources. Only a few times in Michael's book does he refer to uh, independent newspapers like uh, the UK's Independent or The Guardian or Telegraph. Uh, it is interesting that uh, Wall most Street Journal, uh, the New York Times. Very often, once he refers to the New York Times, but when I looked at the footnotes so I can find a New York Times article, I saw that in his footnote, his end note, he says this is uh, personal communication with the author. Mm -hmm. And many times it's just Which personal communication with the author, so we can't really check the sources except That's to ask true. Michael. That's not true. That is not true. And, the New York uh, Times article is a quotation uh, Michael, from the please, New York Times. Please stop interrupting. Well, you've spoken more truth, than sir. anyone else you're not here. The truth. Uh, hold on. Let, let's let's get to to the bottom of this. What, what is important to notice also is that Michael creates a distraction in his book. He thinks that we're distracting from the main issue, but actually his book distracts from the main issue. Which is what the main is issue it? is persecution of people around the globe, uh, to, uh, about which we have to do something. The second thing that Michael's book does is that he tries to paint Islam as warish, Christianity as peaceful, and that's wrong. So he defends the Crusades. I'm surprised at the length to which Steve, he this goes. Is this to is outrageous. I condemn the Crusades. No. Yes, on the one breath, but on the other breath, he tries to show that this falls under just war theory. Moreover, he quotes uh, uh, Jonathan Riley Smith's book on the Crusades as the exemplary book on the Crusades, criticizing other authors who got it all wrong. But on page 24, uh, Jonathan Riley shows that uh, the, the first Crusade is actually also the first Holocaust. On page 23, he has a heading here, the what first Holocaust, which you apparently missed. But he's trying to say that Christians were not following Christianity in doing this. Okay, but in fact, made, let's, let's give it, equal time here. It, it is breathtaking. I can only imagine if there was a TV show in the 1930s in Germany, what we, we would have seen. I ha I'm a student of the Crusades. I've written about it many times. I've written it in, in, in uh, other books. I condemn the Crusades. I actually say it's questionable whether this would be just war. I talk about the slaughter that took place. What I say is that, and if you understand the Crusades uh, and, and the Middle East, you, you would know this, to the, uh, to the Arab world, the Crusades were largely forgotten because they won. The Crusader Kingdom lasted 150 years or so. The irony is the Crusades, the memory was brought back often by Arab Christian nationalists going to Europe for education in the late 19th century. What I say is, and honestly, I'm in shock that you would do such a thing. What I say is the Crusades, A, were a long time ago, and B, shouldn't be allowed to frame and form the relationship between well, Christian and Muslim okay, today. But having said that, is this payback in some respects? Well, I've heard that said before, and I find it a very cold, acid thing to say. No, I, I don't think it is. I, I think, although the term crusader is used by some, that's, uh, that's fairly new. I, I, I think the crusades were largely forgotten. No, I don't think it's about that at all. So, all right, I, go ahead. I, 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 I agree with you to the extent that groups like Al-Qaeda exploit the, the imagined history of the crusades yeah. to justify this um, what they claim is an inherent hatred of Islam on the part of the West. But all I'm saying is that you're doing the reverse. You're attributing the same thing to Muslims by saying that there's an inherent hatred in Islam toward Christians. 
It's, it's, it's the mirror image of Al-Qaeda's ideology. I don't say there's hatred. That's, I say that's, that, that's, I, that's what I'm opposing to. I, what I'm no. saying is that there are deep problems. Some of them are involved perso religious persecution, but they're usually the acts of individuals and groups, and they are pretextual. It's not an organized, systematic, state-centered campaign. Right? And it's, it's, it's usually the fault of bad governance and bad institutions. We need to tackle those problems. If we tackle those problems, we can solve these right. problems. Farzana, please. Well, first of all, I disagree fundamentally with, and respectfully so, with, with Imam Sh Shabir about what he said about you know this not being a very seri a serious issue. It's a very serious issue that all of us I, need to address. I didn't say it's not a serious issue. It's, it's, yeah. you know, I, I didn't we, fly we, there. We, 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 when did I say this is not a serious no, no. issue? Well, you're, you're saying that the book distracts from other issues, but yes, I think that I, the I'm fact saying that it is the a Christians serious are issue, being, being... But this book is also a serious you're issue, I think. You're saying it's not an issue. issue. You're, I'm you're, saying it is an issue, and it is a serious issue, but I'm saying that you're... If I may, if I may, I thought what he said was, this is not the only serious issue. Persecution of minorities around the world is a bigger story than just this. It's the issue that Michael writes about, write about, and that's that. what we're yeah. here to discuss. Okay. And I don't agree at all that Christians somehow have this victim complex that they're always imagining, you know, uh, being persecuted and they're being victimized. You know, Christian women, as we speak, are, are being raped and brutalized in many parts of the Middle East right now. And, and you know, this is widespread. It's, it's not stray incidents here or there. You know, we, we, we really seriously do need to address this, and we as Muslims need to address it. And we need to do something about it. Yeah, you I know, agree, Farzana, but absolutely. if you're going to write a book and collate it's all ISIS. such... It's Pardon ISIS. Me? It's ISIS. It's ISIS. Not exclusively. Right. But, but ISIS is She's using... She's talking about a specific thing. Where ISIS, I agree, ISIS... ISIS is using an I interpretation agree, of Islam to do this. I agree, absolutely. I agree, absolutely. But we need to understand that it is a cultish interpretation of Islam that's repudiated by the vast majority of Muslims, fundamentalists, secular, whatever. This is, this is my point, is that it's dangerous. The kind of theological reductionism that we see in the book is very dangerous. Okay. But the because Muslims who are in, active... Of, the Muslims who are active politically... Suggestions, in terms of policy suggestions, what does it do? If you're a policymaker and you read this book, it tells you Islam is a problem. We well, have to fight Islam. I'll tell you what right? you do. And, and, and say, I say that's exactly the wrong tack to take. What we need to do is try to get functioning states. Okay. But with do just you a few agree minutes, that there me. are doctrines that are corruptible? Uh, uh, absolutely. Uh, with just a few minutes left here, I do want to find out what you would propose to do about all of what you've written about. I think we have to be very strong with governments where persecution takes place. For example, in Pakistan, uh, this absurd war, uh, the Taliban in Afghanistan, I know that's why the money goes to Pakistan and they're a nuclear power, but we have to say to Pakistan, until the blasphemy law is changed, until the persecution stops, there'll certainly be no funding. We have to open our gates to Christian refugees. Sadly, I have no right to say they should remain where they are. Um, we have created, I mean, I, I, if you have read the book, and I wonder if people have, I'm very critical of Western foreign policy. We've created a terrible mess in, in Iraq and Syria. Egypt is a different issue. I mean, Egypt plays with its Christian minority. E Egypt sometimes is more protective, sometimes less so. The rise of the Muslim Brotherhood, the, uh, the mainstream Orthodox sect, I think, has been referred to, has created enormous problems for the Christian minority. It might not call directly for violence, but it's created a context of, if it's not direct dimitude, it's a culture of dimitude. We can't change cultures completely. Uh, we can't say, to, look, Turkey lived as a relatively secular nation for years. Anti-Christian feeling there is extremely high. It's very hard to change your point of view. But we have to be honest enough to ask questions and have a conversation. What I've heard tonight has been extremely depressing and worrying. Well, uh, it may be a reaction to both the title of the book and some of what you put in the book. And I'm wondering if you might have had more a more constructive conclusion to our conversation if you'd written a book about how Christians and Muslims can work together to solve this I problem think rather than what you did. That's what it says in the, in the conclusion of the book. I speak about how there can be coexistence in the future. I talk about where Christians and Muslims too coexist. I, I welcome voices such as this one we have here. I speak to moderate Muslims. But Steve, at a time when every three minutes a Christian is, is attacked for their faith, in, 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 what am I going to call the book? Let's all get along and hold hands. I mean, the, the reaction should not be to the title of a book. The reaction should be to the massacre of Christians that is occurring in so many parts of the Islamic world. Can you sign on to any of the solutions he's just put forward? Well, I think an important solution is for us to start with the actual factual information about <coughs> real persecution, not only of Christians, but people worldwide. We need to know about the persecution of Muslims as well. <coughs> Muslims are suffering uh, in Rohingya, in Muslims are suffering in Kashmir, in Palestine, in the Central African Republic, uh, in so many parts of the 
the world, even in Syria and, and in and Iraq and, and so on, and in Egypt. And when we have all of these uh, proper facts before us, then we can decide what is the next move forward. In fact, we already know that there is persecution, and we have to do what we can as individuals okay. and as societies to uh, stem that, that tide. Mohammed, last minute to you, please. Um, yeah, I would just reiterate what I've tried, been well, trying to say. Can you sign on to any of the solutions that he's put forward? Um, I don't really know particularly what they, what, what they will accomplish, all right? Um, <laughs> so, I mean, for example, cutting off aid to Pakistan. The problem in Pakistan is the government is already very weak. So how are you going to solve problems by making the government weaker? I didn't say that. I said right? that we have but to say that, that aid comes yes, from certain yes, conditions. Yes, but yeah. if, it can't, if it cannot, the government has tried to modify the blasphemy law and it's failed, right? Well, For whatever reasons, right? We could, I can't wave a magic wand and turn think? the population, right, into 180 million liberal subjects. Friends, right? I have to jump in there because that's our time. Muslims. That's our time. Uh, I do want to thank you all for participating in this most intense debate. <laughs> Michael Koren, Farzana Hassan, uh, and on the other side of the table, Shabir Ali and Mohammed Fadl. The name of the book, once again, is Hatred, Islam's War on Christianity. And we thank you all for this last hour of our lives. It was most intriguing. <laughs> Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.